welcome everybody and get started. Welcome to today's research forum, our first of the year on Sunsafe School Uniforms, a collaborative partnership to be presented by Louise Pello, Jody Antrobus, Dr. Simone Harrison and Dr. Tiziana Barrero Regis. I wish to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we gather today, the Turrbal and Yagara people, and recognise that this has always been a place of teaching and learning. I pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples continue to play within the education and research community. Before we start, some brief housekeeping. Um, mobile phones on silent, please. I've just turned mine into silent. It's always embarrassing when you're presenting and your own phone starts ringing. Um, the bathrooms are located on the other side of the lift foyer and in the event of an emergency, we're to move to the stairwell located near the bathrooms and wait for instructions from the fire order. Today's forum is being web conference through the department's learning place and I extend a warm welcome to staff and stakeholders who are watching the forum today online. This web conference recording will be available on our website very soon, so should you know of colleagues who've missed today's session and would like to catch up on all of the exciting things we're going to be talking about, please let them know that they can access this recording. Turning to today's presentation on Sunsafe School Uniforms, a collaborative partnership, Queensland has a year-round high ultraviolet radiation environment and the highest melanoma skin cancer incidence rate in the world. Children and young people's skin is very susceptible to UVR damage, with as few as five severe sunburns in this critical period, more than doubling melanoma risk. Longitudinal research studies demonstrate the wearing of broad brim hats and sun protective clothing in childhood significantly reduces the development and lifetime melanoma risk. At this forum, we will hear Queensland Government and University experts explain how their collaborative partnership is successfully providing best practice some safe school uniforms for Queensland primary and secondary school students. <coughs> melanoma is something that's quite personal to myself. I had a melanoma removed when I was 25 and I'm now a frequent visitor to my dermatologist, so I know all about the risk of melanoma. Now, turning to my presenters, Louise Pello is a manager in State Schools Operations in the Queensland Department of Education. Louise will be presenting on the Department's Sun Safety Policy Perspective and outline our close working relationship with Queensland Health in developing Sun Safe School Uniforms. Jody Andrews is a Senior Health Promotion Officer within the Preventive Health Branch, Queensland Health. Jody will describe the Sun Safe School Uniform Project, its evidence base, and how Queensland Health worked with the Department's Procurement Services Branch to embed mandatory Sun Safe specifications for all school uniform clothing options in the Department's procurement process. This will be a game changer in reducing future generation skin cancer risk. Dr. Simone Harrison is the Director of JCU's Skin Cancer Research Unit, an Adjunct Associate Professor at USQ and member of the School Uniform Advisory Panel. Her groundbreaking NHMRC funded study demonstrated that regularly wearing sun protective clothing slows mole development in childhood, a major risk factor for melanoma. Simone will present her research on how clothing coverage can reduce UVR exposure and melanoma risk. Her findings informed the department's uniform design change and influenced the revised Australian and New Zealand standard for sun protective clothing. And Dr. Tiziana is a senior lecturer and study area coordinator at QUT. She previously worked in the creative industries in advertising and publishing, including in Vogue Italy Milan, which is very exciting. Tiziana will showcase the co-design process for the junior uniforms of students attending the new Fortitude Valley State Secondary College in 2020. Design considerations included issues such as modesty, gender equality, body shape and aesthetic considerations, as well as the essential sun safe perspectives. As we're web conferencing today, we'll leave most audience questions to the end of the presentation. But that being said, we're a small group, so do feel free to have a conversation with our presenters. 
Please join me in welcoming Louise Keller to the stage. Is it so? Thank you. Um, welcome to today's forum. Um, and as it's already men mentioned, I'm a manager in the operations branch of State Schools Division, which is a team that looks after a range of departmental policies and procedures, including, relevantly for today, the sun safety strategy and the student dress code procedure. I'm going to give you a brief overview of these two procedures and then a, a short introduction to the process of the interagency collaboration that resulted in the project that uh, the speakers are going to be presenting for you today. So the department has a supporting student health and wellbeing policy statement and in there it outlines that all Queensland state schools have a sun safety strategy that's been developed in consultation with their school community. And that sun safety strategy will incorporate specific things such as flexible planning to reduce time spent in the sun as much as possible between the hours at the moment of 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. It also requires that a student dress code um, requires the wearing of hats and swim shirts for students and that there is the provision of SPSF 30 plus or more broad spectrum water resistant sunscreen for students to use at the school. Often the strategy will incorporate other localised approaches that are suitable for that particular school. It may be things like maximising the use of available shade for outdoor activities, it also often will highlight the role of adults in the school, whether that be parents, teachers, volunteers, other um, adult uh, supervisors that come in as role models for the students in relation to sun protection strategies. There's also um, that strategy of, and I think this is going to certainly be covered more, where schools look at what are the uniform design requirements that are going to be appropriate for our school. So the department obviously we have these um, the policy statement and the sun safety strategies that are up uh, available on our website and while the sun safety strategies and the policy are not they're not fully prescriptive because we really recognize that schools need to be doing this um, in a localized manner. The student dress code procedure um, has been, I suppose it's well, probably last year, was reviewed and updated or, um, and it requires, again, that the student dress code be developed in consultation with the school community. There obviously is a, request, a requirement that what is developed is consistent with health and safety considerations. It must comply with anti-discrimination legislation. It must consider affordability, functionality and the durability of uniform items and provide uniform options including shorts and pants in all uniform categories for all students regardless of gender. So these, especially in relation to the health and safety considerations, this is where our involvement um, between the, the link between the sun safety and the student dress code has arisen. With um, our, well, I suppose we as a, as a department, we acknowledge that our expertise is in the area of schools and how they operate. We are not the experts in public health. Um, we're not the experts in advice around skin cancer or sun safety or what the latest evidence-based practice is. We actively seek this information from other agencies and in relation to sun safety, it's usually Queensland Health, Cancer Council Queensland. Um, we take the expert advice from these external organisations and through the lens of our Department of Education strategic vision and our understanding of our state school environment and experience, we shape that into Department of Education policy and procedure. 
Now, when, a, when innovative um, opportunities present to the department through this consultation with external agencies, we like to make the most of that and we will involve the relevant areas of our department um, as appropriate to the ideas that are being raised. So the project that's being presented today initially was raised way back in 2014. When I wrote 2014, it didn't seem like such a long time ago, but I now realise that's quite a while ago now, six years. Um, and that was with Queensland Health approaching Department of Education with a project proposal about developing design guidelines for sun safe school uniforms. In 2016, this crystallised further and we formalised some collaborative efforts to address this, what was a known um, policy to practice gap. And thus started the discussions between State Schools Operations, Queensland Health, um, our Department of Education Procurement Services branch, um, QUT, JCU um, as well, to, to, to lead us to where we are today, where um, we haven't got it solved, I don't believe, but we are certainly so far down the track in, in bridging that gap between what we know and what we actually can do and are doing in our state schools. So that, that's my brief introduction. Um, I'd like to hand over now to Jody. My name is Jodie Antrobus. I'm Senior Health Promotion Officer with Department of Health in the Preventive Health Branch. And thank you very much for the invitation to come here and talk about this project today. Um, Apologies about that, I'm not very familiar with this uh, technology. So I guess um, Angela has already alluded to why this is such a significant issue here in Queensland. We do have an, a high to extreme UV environment all year round here. So that makes us very different from our colleagues in southern states. Uh, unfortunately, we do have the the title, unfortunately, of the skin cancer capital of the world, and that's something that we're not proud of and are working across government and with other partners to try to change over time. Uh, many people actually think that skin cancer is an older person's condition, and I think we've heard today that this certainly isn't the case. In fact, it's the most commonly diagnosed cancer among people in the 15 to 29 year age group. And it's the most common cause of cancer death for people aged 20 to 39 years. So it's certainly not an older person's cancer. I think, and as has been highlighted, you know, children and young people's skin is very vulnerable to UVR damage from the sun. A lot of people don't actually realise that there's no real cues to highlight to people when they are being exposed to UVR. You can't see it, you can't feel it, and it's certainly not related to heat. And I think that's a little bit of a misconception out there among the community that, well, if it isn't hot, I'm not going to get sunburnt or sun damaged. And we know that that certainly is not the case because unprotected skin here in Queensland will burn in as little as 10 minutes and I think you know that that really is not a long time frame at all. It's all been mentioned that um, sustaining as few as five severe sunburns during childhood and adolescence more than doubles your melanoma risk. So clearly this is a very critical time and opportunity to improve uptake of some safe behaviour and help to help our young people to establish this as an embedded part of their daily practice. 
What we also know from uh, data that we collect in, de in the Department of Health and is reported every two years through uh, Dr Jeanette Young, our Chief Health Officer's uh, report on the health of Queenslanders, is that we have very high sunburn rates. Uh, in fact, 46% of children aged 5 to 17 year olds, so that's about 394,000 children, reported having been sunburnt in the previous 12 months in 2018. So, you know, nearly half of our, our children. So I think this brings us to why we in Department of Health have always been so keen to work in a very collaborative manner with our colleagues in Department of Education. Schools are such a great setting for s supporting and embedding so many healthy lifestyle practices and behaviours. And sun safety is certainly no different. Why? Kids are there most of the day, most days of the week, majority weeks of the year. We also know that the schools are a wonderful environment to help normalise sun safe practice. You know, if your peers are doing this, we just all get on and do it. And it helps normalise it, not just in the school setting, but beyond that school setting as well. And that's really important. So, our collaborative partnership. Louise has already provided a wonderful platform about our, our partnership approach in this area. But, you know, we, we have had a long-standing shared interest in supporting sun safety in schools. Um, and as Louise has mentioned, this is a, um, a requirement for all Queensland state schools to, to work towards developing a sun safe policy or strategy that's localised for their own uh, school situation. And clearly, sun safe uniforms are a really important component of that broader, comprehensive approach for sun safety. Um, Louise has already spoken about the uh, work that we did many years ago to initially identify that there was this policy to practice gap and start to think about ways that we could address this. And. Um, yeah, well, I think we're, we've certainly made some excellent strides in, in progressing this. So, in um, I think all of our approaches, whether you work in Department of Health or work in Department of Education, we're all very much about evidence-based practice. And we strongly use research to inform our policy and practice. There has been irrefutable evidence that having increased skin coverage um, significantly reduces skin cancer risk. And our, my colleague, Dr. Simone Harrison, will talk a lot more about this in her presentation, so I won't go into it. Uh, but this research actually influenced a significant change in the Australian New Zealand standard for sun protective clothing. And Simone will also speak further to that. Um, it now incorporated minimum standards for body um, coverage, so the amount of skin that uh, clothing is required to cover, in addition to having um, UPF ratings for fabrics. And also the updated standard has provided a simplified UPF rating system for fabrics. But, um, so. How have we done this? We really novel approach. Like, to be perfectly honest, I didn't know a whole lot about procurement before this beyond the procurement approach that I've used in Department of Health where we've actually <coughs> engaged external agencies to deliver programs for us or in a hospital setting where we might have you know, used procurement to purchase equipment, consumables, that sort of thing. So. It was a really interesting un, um, understanding for me when um, I initially started talking about this with our policy colleagues and they invited our procure, you know, procurement colleagues along and I thought, oh, now what, how's this all going to work? And then it became very apparent to me that, you know, 
all of the years that I've been buying uniforms for my children through the uniform shop, there was a whole process that sat behind that to support Queensland schools and um, with the supply of uniforms. And so the procurement process provided a really strong vehicle to provide a really simple and sustainable solution for the supply of Sunsafe uniforms for Queensland schools. So what I did know is that I didn't have the expertise to support Department of Ed to do this on my own. And thankfully, I have uh, a wonderful network of academic and um, colleagues and, and experts who do have a lot of this expertise. So we ended up forming an advisory committee of which uh, Dr Simone Harrison was a com uh, crucial component of. Um, Dean Broth, who uh, is one of my long-standing colleagues at QUT in the Creative Industries Faculty and is a absolute expert in clothing design, construction quality, um, around fabrics that um, also provide great UPF protection but are also cool and comfortable to wear in our Queensland climate. Um, and myself uh, providing a SunSafe policy perspective from the Department of Health and um, our wonderful colleagues in the procurement area, Vicky Dixon, who is the procurement manager within Department of Education. So we worked with Vicky and her team over a couple of months um, to embed uh, some safe specification for every clothing item that was on the Department of Education's uniform options list that schools could choose from to um, establish or create their own, own uniform. Uh, that, that tender process was then released to a range of suppliers and uh, a requirement was that each supplier who wished to apply to be on the panel had to provide a basket of goods in two separate sizes that we, the advisory committee, reviewed and um, undertook quite a rigorous evaluation process to determine their compliance with the Australian New, St New Zealand standard for sun protective clothing. And um, we also considered a range of other important considerations like, was the fabric suitable for Queensland climate? Um, you know, was it durable? Was it going to launder well? Was it affordable? Um, fit for purpose and of course complied with Department of Ed's dress code policy. So there was a lot of considerations within that evaluation process. Um, the measurement approach that we used around the body surface area coverage, the amount of skin that the uniforms covered, um, replicated that that is used by the Australian standard for sun protective clothing and I think that Simone probably will talk to that further in her presentation. Um, this approach ensured that we had a very objective and consistent measured approach to ensure compliance with the sun safe body coverage specifications. Um, we were also really trying to influence and improve industry practice. So part of that process was to provide very specific feedback to suppliers following their tender process that, and, and Vicky coordinated that all for us about where they might have been, you know, very close to complying. We, we provided that advice and request request that they, you know, expand their um, body area surface coverage or something, you know, so that we did influence and change industry practice. Um, some of the tools that we used to support um, suppliers 
and also schools to understand this process was we um, developed a fact sheet um, that provided a lot of information about the changes to the Australian and New Zealand standard for sun protective clothing and how this has influenced the new approach for um, supply of sun safe school uniforms. Um, we also provided uh, presentations both face to face and via video conference link for um, suppliers um, that were appointed to the panel in the end to help them to really understand the rationale and the benefits and their key role in supporting the provision of sun safe school uniforms. And that I think that was very well taken up by the suppliers and you know they certainly could see that they had an important role and were able to contribute in this process. So I think there are a lot of benefits of the model of using procurement for SunSafe school uniforms. It's really provided a very simple solution for Queensland schools. If they buy through the supplier panel um, that the Department of Education has established, they can be very, very confident that they will have high quality uniforms that are durable, comfortable to wear and cool for the Queensland environment, but are also best practice sun safe uniforms that they will also be complying with the Department of Education dress code. Importantly, this has ex provided a very, very strong platform to help shift cultural norms around clothing and to increase the acceptability of sun-safe clothing among our young people and particularly around hat wearing. So moving away from caps to having broad brim and bucket style hats. So, um, so I mentioned this beyond school uniforms, this provided a really strong opportunity to engage more broadly with the clothing design and manufacturing industry who also supply to retailers. So you know, they could see what we were trying to do with a school uniform approach and we, we are ever hopeful that perhaps it started to shift their thinking about design considerations for the broader retail market. So what potential does this have for Queensland children? There's Nearly, well, nearly 1,800 state, independent and Catholic primary and secondary schools are able to purchase through this approved supplier arrangement. That is around 320,000 Queensland students. Thinking back to the stats that I mentioned earlier about you know, 394,000 children being sunburnt in the past year, we're having the opportunity to reach a heck of a lot of those through this process. As we've mentioned earlier, this will undoubtedly reduce children's UVR exposure and their future skin cancer risk. And Dr Jeanette Young, our Queensland Chief Health Officer, firmly believes that this will be a game changer in reducing future generation skin cancer risk. So she has been so very proud of this work that she has written to Department of Education Director General um, about the partnership approach and um, highlighted you know, what, what she thinks is uh, wonderful work to improve sun safety for Queensland children. Um, and excitingly, beyond, you know, word spreads well in Queensland government. And um, 
other government departments now have approached both myself and Vicky Dixon um, in the procurement services here to start to inquire about the opportunity to use this model uh, for a whole of government approach for purchasing SunSafe school uniforms. So I think, you know, Department of Education should be very proud that they were at the forefront of taking the leadership in embedding this approach for Queensland school students and now, you know, government is seeing the benefits of this more broadly and looking at a whole of government approach for the supply of uniforms. So, um, from small things, big things grow sometimes. Uh, there is also the opportunity for other jurisdictions, both nationally and internationally, to replicate this model. Um, and to the very best of any of our knowledge, from um, Department of Health perspective and the academic, our academic colleagues, no one else has done this type of work before. So, you know, we are a little bit groundbreaking here in Queensland. So, thank you very much. That's Wow, you're in for a treat. Um, I don't usually get to hold the remote at home. I'm glad this is being recorded. I can show my husband. Um, <laughs> he'll be very concerned if he knows. But anyhow, um, I guess I want to thank the department for bringing me here from Townsville today. And apologies for my late arrival. Traffic took a bit more than I'd anticipated. It's quick to get across Townsville these days compared to here. I am sorry, I was going to bring my mannequin with me to show you exactly what we dressed. Uh, when we were evaluating the clothing, but being dropped off in Margaret Street and I have walked with my mannequin, uh, which is the size of a six-year-old child, under my arm, at QT before to visit Dean Bruff um, when we were doing this work and Jodie was there also and its arm fell off and sometimes it loses its head and so whether or not it would have made it safely here remains to be seen. So apologies for not bringing it, perhaps it's a blessing. Let's see how we go. Um, and I'll also acknowledge the efforts of my colleagues from JCU as well. Um, my mentor over the past 30 years, the late Professor um, Bob McLennan, formerly of QIMR. Um, he was a groundbreaking melanoma epidemiologist that I had the opportunity to work with through and um, was supervised through my PhD with, and Petra Butner and Madeline Novak, and also the evaluation team that you've heard about because you'll, you'll see some of the antics that we got up to with our mannequins. Now, I guess I don't need to spend very long here because Jodie's done such a thorough job for us, but basically if you look on the left here, you see the distribution of the intensity of solar UV across the country annualised. Um, and basically the warmer the colour, although purple, anyway, um, imagine purple is a warmer colour than red, we see an increasing intensity in UV radiation with decreasing latitude. So as we're getting closer to the equator, uh, we're seeing UV over the year increasing and you know Brisbane's right in there in the red and we're certainly up around Cairns and I can tell you a lot of the time uh, we measure on the rooftop for the Arpanza network the UV radiation in Townsville and we often sit in the extreme range and this isn't just in summer this happens through winter the further north we go in our country so we have a situation that exists throughout the year and you've probably heard about when the UV index is below three that we can abandon hats or whatever um, this doesn't actually happen up north where we're from so we have high UV year-round and as a consequence you see on the right hand side when we look at the number of new cases of melanoma that are diagnosed in Australia each year once again they increase with proximity to the equator and Queensland has the unenviable reputation as being the skin cancer capital you'll often hear that we've been knocked off our perch by New Zealand um, what happens there is we're comparing country rates where we look at the melanoma incidence for New Zealand as a country versus Australia as a whole 
Queensland as a state has rates of melanoma that far surpass anything that's recorded anywhere on the planet. Uh, we have a highly susceptible, primarily Caucasian population, um, a love of the sun, uh, high intensity, and as you'll see in these slides, increased numbers of moles, which sets us up for risk of melanoma. So why do pigmented moles matter and why have I spent the last 30 years kind of um, being dubbed as the mole lady that counts moles on children and carries mannequins around? Um, it's a major risk factor for melanoma. Basically, the more moles you have, the greater your risk of melanoma. It's quite simple. It's something that's very visible, um, unlike other cancers. So in that sense, early detection should be quite easy. So it's something we have the opportunity to do something about. We know that um, pigmented moles, there's evidence of their existence in at least 60% of new melanomas that turn up. There'll be some evidence that that arose in a mole. We also know that moles tend to be more prevalent on the parts of our body that are routinely exposed to sunshine. Now, it doesn't mean we don't get them, the parts of our body that don't see the sun, but there's certainly a lot more of them if you look over the body surface. And before I started this work 30 years ago, there was some groundbreaking research that had been done in that area in Sydney um, and also in Glasgow in Scotland, looking at this distribution of moles in the population and large numbers of people. And last but not least, a relationship to childhood sun exposure. Now we knew from um, Bruce Armstrong's work back in the 80s, he undertook his PhD looking at um, melanoma and moles in immigrants to Australia that had a Caucasian background. And he found that people that arrived here after the age of 10 had both lower rates of melanoma and developed fewer moles. When he compared those to people that turned up here before the age of 10, they developed melanoma with the same frequency as the rest of us and developed almost as many moles. Um, so that, that was, these are the hints that point us in the direction to the relationship between moles um, and sun exposure that we'll talk about today. We'll just look at this quickly. We did a study um, back in the 1990s where we followed um, a birth cohort from birth. A birth cohort from birth, of course we did. Yes, for three years. And the blue line um, shows the Australian children that I was looking at in Townsville. And Rona Mackay, who's a, a dermatologist that's very well known in Scotland, had a similar birth cohort that she'd recruited. And we compared over time the rise in mole numbers. And you can see that we, here in Australia, our kids start developing their moles very early in life and very large numbers. So the difference between the groups is quite substantial already by three years of age. I think a thing to notice here um, is also, oops, sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Thing to notice here is at birth, just about everyone has no moles. In fact, one to two percent of us will be born with a single mole. That's generally the norm, sometimes three percent. And yet all of us have some moles by the time we've reached adulthood. So that gives you some insight as to what's happening over time. I was also involved um, with a group. This is where I met Bob McLennan from QIMR um, back in 1990, showing my age, where we did a study in school children and we thought we'd recruit a cross section in each place. We looked at 1172 children. We had dermatologists come in and do the counts in schools. And we looked at mole numbers in 6, 9, 12 and 15 year olds from Melbourne, Sydney and Townsville. And I don't have to bore you to death with the fact that it's pretty clear that the mole numbers were increasing with proximity to the equator. I'm seeing this pattern with melanoma as we pointed out. So latitude of residence basically and by implication your ambient UV exposure was strongly related to mole counts. So it, it made sense to then go on and say right well rather than looking in an ecological study where we recruit people in the population but don't ask them too much about the time they spend in the sun, we would have a close group that we followed over time. And my PhD project involved recruiting one to six year old children that had been born in Townsville and examining them for moles. There were 506 kids in this study um, and I'm still examining these people today. Um, some of whom were born in 1985, so they're 35, but just a little bit 
older than me. Uh, a little bit younger than me, <laughs> I just, I wish. Um, you can see that sunlight increased very steadily. Um, sorry, mole counts increased very steadily with the amount of time spent outdoors. Now, of course, not everyone's similar. We have differences in our natural skin colour. Um, we have differences in eye colour, hair colour, all of the things that you would have heard about that can make a difference to your melanoma risk. So when we factor these into a multivariate analysis, what we found was that having a single sunburn um, before you turned seven, so it could have happened in your, your sixth year of life, you're almost twice as likely to be in the highest counts of moles for your age groups. With age group with everything else taken into account. We also found that children that spent more than four hours a day outside were 3.3 times as likely to be in the highest category of moles for their age group compared to the kids that were outside less than an hour per day. So this was the first direct evidence where we looked at sun diaries um, and parents recording information on their children going outside um, that showed this relationship with mole development and pointing to sun exposure. And subgroups of, these, of this cohort that we still maintain today have worn polysulfone badges for us um, over a period of time to give us an idea objectively, not just from questionnaire, of the amount of sun exposure that they get. So it really followed that um, if this were really true and this relationship with sun exposure influenced mole development. We know that genetics is part of the picture. We can't be modifying that at the moment. But if part of this picture, and it was significant enough, was related to sun exposure, if we tried to reduce that sun exposure by providing clothing or sunscreen or whatever, some kind of intervention, we figured we should be able to prevent some moles. And if we couldn't, with, our, with a large enough sample size, we'd be left in question about whether this relationship was real. So we, to date, have done, I believe, the only randomised control trial where we had 25 daycare centres in Townsville, all the daycare centres that we had that had a baby unit, so caring from kids from six weeks of age. Um, and they were randomised into either an intervention group that got given um, clothing. This was funded by NHMRC. Um, and then there were 12 daycare centres, there were originally 13, but one dropped out over time because of a change of ownership. Um, those 12 control centres were used as our comparison group. So what we did here was examine all of these children, and there were 770 odd of them um, in the beginning. Um, some dropped out of the study. Um, the numbers that we look at are based on complete data records over time. Um, they all had their moles counted. And we compare this group over time to see that we're actually starting with a similar bunch of kids, that we didn't have the moly group in the clothing um, group and the, uh, the children with less moles um, in the control group, so that we knew we were at where we were at from the beginning. Now, the 13 intervention centres were given customised high UPF clothing, and, and Jody talked about the UPF before. In simple terms, that's the amount of UV radiation that can actually pass through the fabric. Um, so that has nothing to do with the body surface coverage of a garment. And currently the UPF ratings that we see that tell us if something's some protective clothing or not is based purely on that. Doesn't matter how big the garment is, even if it's a bikini, which I'll be talking about some more because I have some strong opinions about this. Um, the staff at the daycare centres, when we provided all of this clothing, there was enough to clothe all children, irrespective of whether they participated in the mole study or not. Over time, everyone got dressed routinely every day and staff were trained so that the trunk, naturally, was covered. The back of the neck was covered by the Legionnaire's hat that you see here. They wore T-shirts. Um, you can see the red t-shirts there that came to at least the elbows and they had shorts that were a high P UPF fabric that came to just above the knees. So this talks a little bit about the design. I won't labour that point too much. We were able to colour code the shirts um, for the staff to make it quick and easy for them when dressing a bunch of kids, because this is what they had to do on arrival each day. Child turns up, taken out of its clothes, put into our clothes, there all day. We had a laundry service provided over five and a half years that we visited 
two times a week um, to pick up the dirty laundry and give them the clean laundry back and that way we could actually be sure that the clothes were being worn because it's one thing to expect to see a difference but what if nobody was actually putting the clothes on the kids so that gave us some insight and look you know, you could say that maybe they were putting it on for us, but two visits a week and we used to rotate our roster so they didn't know what time we'd turn up. They usually had a rough idea which were the two days we might turn up um, and we shifted that around a bit. But we're pretty sure that people weren't just trying to impress us and racing to put the clothes on when we'd turn up in our JCU car with um, the fresh laundry. So we did know these kids really were wearing these clothes and, and we got to see that over time. Now for home use, the kids were also provided with a piece of um, Sunsafe clothing um, each year. They were given a swim shirt with long sleeves, as you can see here. Um, sorry, that's a Lycra suit, swim shirts as well with long sleeves and a Legionnaire hat for home use. There was only so much we could do to control the home factor, but if we could actually alter what was happening while they were regularly at daycare, we'd see how much of a difference we could make. This is a real life study and having a look at an imperfect world where we see what's possible to achieve. We all know that you know, in well-designed laboratory um, studies with animals, we can, we can do all sorts of things and show maximal differences. But when we're actually dealing with humans and personalities, and believe me, these kids had personalities. I hadn't anticipated having to screenshot Thomas the Tank Engine or something like it, or um, butterflies on the shirts. But they developed an opinion about what they would wear as they grew. And um, so some kids would throw tanty. So we had to have those decorated nicely so they wanted to wear these shirts and I'm sure Tiziana's sitting here going wow that's not actually beautiful but they were sun safe and it was the 90s and the nice thing is it actually worked right so um, we did find that sun safe clothing really could prevent moles now this didn't mean these kids didn't have any moles at all what it meant was that the kids that had been in the clothing group for three and a half years and followed over time and they're the grey bars that you see and increasing follow-up time always had uh, sorry the grey bars are the control group the white group is the clothing group so the clothing group consistently each year had fewer moles than the kids that were controls left to wear what they want now that's in the control scenario, we didn't go about saying to parents, don't sun protect your kids, naturally. Um, those control centres carried on with normal sun protection. So if that child usually wore a t-shirt and long shorts to kindy, that's what happened. They wore their regular hat and they had sunscreen applied as per normal. Better move along. So what, what we saw by by three and a half years of follow-up was that on the parts of the body that we had specifically covered, now that's the back of the neck, the trunk, so the upper arms to the elbows and down to the knees, we're not talking about the whole body, we're talking about 50% of the surface, we saw a 32% difference in the number of moles that was developing in these kids. So it's over three and a half years. You're at school for 13 years. So. I was asked a question the other day by um, a new student of mine that's here in the room about what difference could five centimetres in sleeve met length make? You know, is it a big enough difference? Well, I think this shows that you don't have to make a massive difference in the body surface area to get a really good result, particularly where you're talking about 13 years of consistent protection over five days a week. So. Um, it's been my honour, um, by luck with the work that I've done, that I've been invited, well back in 2015, there were some thoughts about um, revisiting Australia and New Zealand's um, Sun Protective Clothing Standard. Now this had been written in 1996, it was a one of a kind, um, no other country uh, had any Sun Protective Clothing labels, so this was really quite something. Um, and it was developed by Peter Gies, who's a, a very well-known Australian scientist who recently retired. Uh, and I got the opportunity to know him quite well. And he was aware of the success of our randomised control trial and was quite keen to get the 
the standard reopen for consideration, that having a look at how much UV that goes through clothing maybe wasn't enough. It was a great place to start. And like the Heart Foundation tick and all the things that we um, put in place over time, manufacturers are very clever, clever marketers. And so over time, they can sometimes come up with interesting strategies to help sell, in this case, their garments. So here we are with the bikini with the UPF rating because it's made of lycra and that's got a tight weave. And so if you hold it up to light, not much UV goes through. And I have had long battles on the Australian Standards Committee. The technical committee that I'm part of has representatives from all walks of life, represents the manufacturers. We have people from Target and yeah, all manner of um, manufacturers. We also have the Australian Consumers Association uh, with whom I have long battles about why it's misleading to put a UPF rating and imply that a bikini is some protective. And I often have the response given to me that people deserve to know if it's really good fabric that they're covering their nipples with. And on goes the debate. But clearly from the work we've done in children, increasing the body surface area of the clothing, that actually makes a bigger difference than the UPF of the fabric within reason, given the fabrics that we have on the market. So prone to misuse. So, like I said, um, the revision came about. I joined the committee, the technical committee in 2015. Rome wasn't built in a day. Lots, lots of battles and discussion representing everyone's point of view. And finally, um, in 2017, we went to print with a, a revised Australian standard uh, this is around the time the Commonwealth Games were happening and they knew the standard was coming and Australia really wanted to have sunsafe uniforms and everyone wanted to know what was going to be in this standard which was commercially sensitive and we couldn't share a lot of. So I had the honour of also working with um, the Commonwealth Games uniform coordinator as well as, well as um, Dean Bruff from QUT, who's on our evaluation panel, to try and gear them up so that we have uniforms that Australia could be quite proud of for their athletes within reason, there are other considerations as well, and more importantly, well, perhaps not more importantly, but where we could make a difference was with our volunteers and our officials. So anyway, eventually this did go to press and we did achieve um, some strides, not as much as we'd like, so we're at it again and we've just last night I signed off on the 2020 version, another revision of the Australian standard that will go to print uh, where we've made some further refinements to clarify things for manufacturers and hopefully all of us going forward when we're buying some protective clothing. Certainly as parents, if all we've got are these UPF tags, which were useful in the beginning but now we've come up with some other ideas that should be added to that. Certainly labels that show both body surface area and UPF would be useful to us and that's kind of where we're trying to head. So the standard that we used when we dressed our mannequin and evaluated all of the samples that came in in response to the SOA that um, Vicky led us on um, took into account body surface area. I'll show you the, the model in a minute, but basically the standard requires that to be called some protective clothing now, an upper body garment needs to have sleeves that go at least three quarters of the way to the elbows. A lower body garment has to go at least halfway between the crutch and the top of the knee measured by the inner thigh measurement. Um, you might say, wow, that's not that much, which I always feel, you know, this is a great stride from where we've come. We didn't have body surface measured before. We had bikinis that were part of our um, Australian and New Zealand standard. And bearing in mind this was adopted in America and Europe. Um, Britain was separate then. It was before the EU that they actually had their own um, sun protective clothing standard as well. So there was replication of our UPF model, which is impressive that we were leading the way. We actually fell behind a little bit because even Europe 
added um, body surface coverage to their standard well before Australia. Anyway, nevertheless, we know by doing this in kids, it's enough to change their mole development over three and a half years. The nice thing that has been achieved a bit more recently in our 2020 standard is that we've added in some design features. We, this wasn't clarified as well in the 2017 standard and in conjunction with Jody and, and Dean and certainly Vicky, we decided that we go more for the gold standard and educate our suppliers on better necklines, collars and all of these things. Very nice to be able to tell you that the standard has moved on since then and also adopted um, that point of view so that brief items certainly can't be included as some protective clothing or labelled um, as such and marketed as such anymore and that our collars um, are acceptable if they're high and don't provide too much exposure to the collarbone area. Trying to avoid deep Vs like you can see here in the school uniforms and the same with the back of the neck, trying to have higher coverage so that we don't have the mole development and the posterior neck region that you can see in this young boy. So that all, um, we won't have to agonise over what's included in our pamphlets that goes out to suppliers next time round. The standard has caught up a little bit with our thinking um, in the three years that's passed um, since it first was pub republished. The standard also has minimum requirements for hats. That was in the 2017 version as well. What we have with brim width is that a legionnaire and a broad brim hat um, for an adult um, or a person with a head circumference that we might consider to have the body size of an adult, has a 56 centimetre head, um, must have a brim width of 7.5 centimetres. And a smaller person with a smaller head circumference where there could be some obstruction of vision um, has to have a brim width of at least six centimetres. And this is measured now in the, the front, the peak of the legionnaires, as you can see from the dotted line, um, and same with the, the broad brim, but that should be all around. Um, bucket hats, irrespective of size, have to be a minimum of six centimetres. The nice thing about the um, 2000, ooh, sorry, something's happened there. The nice thing about the standard is that um, caps can no longer brag about being some protective Naturally, they do provide some sun protection, but like the bikini, there's a little bit, you know, that's a little bit misleading because uh, it's certainly not um, based on best practice. And the same with visors, they're no longer allowed in the standard. We also have some other changes like gloves, etc. must cover the full area of the back of the hands and um, certainly the standard talks about baby wraps and an assortment of other things. But for our purposes with school uniforms, uh, we'll, we'll stick to the kind of garments you'd expect to turn up as part of your school uniform collection. And then Jody already alluded to this, that we revised the UPF classification scheme. Once upon a time, uh, we considered a UPF of 15. It was labelled as good when Peter Geese first released this in 1996. We don't call it good anymore, we call it minimum, because it is the minimum allowable um, in order to show a UPF rating now. So fabrics have to accomplish that as well as body surface coverage in order to earn a swing tag these days. Good is a UPF of 30 plus, so that's basically protecting 96 points, um, blocking 96.7% of UV from going through the material and anything rated as excellent is either a 50 or a 50 plus. 50 plus is where it exceeds 2%. Um, 2% um, is all the UV that's allowed through those fabrics and they earn an excellent rating. But like I said, once upon a time you would have seen a drill cap with a UPF of 50 plus on it and in time now with the standard um, you won't be seeing that anymore. So the garment evaluation process where we started playing with mannequins. We had to come up with ways of measuring the body surface um, 
There are lots of very sophisticated approaches to do this, whether there's CT scanning, this kind of work's been done for burn area. People that um, experience a burn, they are usually treated according to the body surface that's been damaged by the burn. So there are some technologies around to look at this. But everyone said to me, oh, it's all very well to say that you want to include body surface area in the way clothing's um, labelled, but you can't do that. that. That's not possible. Well, we're along the path in achieving that, and certainly with um, our Queensland school uniforms, that's what we did. Um, we, our shortlisted applicants that you heard about, um, Jody told you we got size 6 and size 12 samples come in and we had a measurement approach that we based both on the standard from 2017 and some work that be, we'd been doing in working out the body surface area of a 6 year old and a 12 year old average Australian child um, so that we could see how the, the garments compared. So, this is where, this is my mannequin where the arm falls off, etc., and has been carted around in rain and gets dribbly. We need to do some third, uh, some 3D scanning of this very precious um, mannequin. Um, we actually had to source a mannequin that had the body dimensions that we needed. I can tell you that was no easy task either. Um, and to do this in all, for all age groups and rule up the body surface area using one centimetre gradients. So we have cut, cross sections cut through the body every one centimetre. And what we do is we dress uh, as part of our evaluation, our shortlisted candidates, we would put, <laughs> I would put the dress on them and I would take a photograph of the front, the side and the back and we would count the lines that were visible. If uh, we knew exactly how many lines needed to be covered to be three quarters of the way to the elbow, so to be compliant with the standard, and that's what we looked at. If only part of the, I oh, don't know, there's probably, is this a pointer? Yes, there we go. If only part of a line was covered, as is the case with the sleeve there, that didn't count. Um, so the line above was deemed to be the amount of coverage um, and this was an assessment that we based body surface area for the school uniforms on. We also had shorts. Um, as you can see over here, having to reach the knees. And this gave us uh, same mannequin, same person, same distance, same photography method. This gave us a standardised objective approach to comparing the body surface coverage of these samples. And making sure that we were three quarters of the way to the elbow at least and halfway between the crutch and the knees. Jody, a trusty helper, measured. We didn't have a size 12 mannequin um, that met with Australian standards at the, well, met with the body surface requirements of a 12 year old child, nor did we have the time to draw those graduated markings because that takes several days in a lab. So we had to, with Dean's help, work out what dimensions would mean. Um, your tops will be three quarters of the way to the elbow and lower body garments will be halfway between the crutch and the knee. So we worked out that anything that was at least 21 centimetres in the sleeve length for a size 12 and in a thigh measurement of at least 14 points or exceeding 14.6 centimetres would be compliant with the standard. It was a load of fun, wasn't it Jody? We you can dress ups is fun. I used to enjoy it as a child, but the novelty wears off when you've got lots of clothes to wade through. But we knew we were doing something that was objective that hasn't been done before. And we do hope to be the reason I took all these photographs is so that we can digitise this and look at an automated approach um, where we'll be less dependent on counting lines. It is a simple approach and it works, but it's a time consuming one. Um, Yep, so same thing, measuring the brims of the hats, the wide brim and your bucket hats as per what was included in the standard. Okay, sorry, I've gone way over time. So the moral of the story is where do we go from here? I think we've got, hopefully I've convinced you that, you know, a couple of centimetres here and there where it be hem length, sleeve length, etc., can make a huge difference then multiplied out by 13 years of protection in the school setting could, be quite, could make quite a substantial difference um, to Queensland school children and may help 
level the playing field when it comes to melanoma. When we set out to do our randomised control trial, our objective was to turn our Queensland children into the mole count equivalents of um, their Sydney counterparts from the earlier study. So that's what we were setting out to achieve and we actually managed to do that because we only needed to make a 25% difference in mole counts over the three years and that was accomplished. So look what we could accomplish with our kids if we work in partnership. There's certainly some opportunities around. There's some partnership grants that can enable us to go further with this work. And I think whilst we've done a really objective study here and evaluation of the clothing, we're also putting some faith in our suppliers in putting clothing out into the market that represents what they sent us to measure. So an important study that we want to do, and Shiva is here today, she's our PhD student at JCU, and she'll be working closely with Jodie and I'll be introducing her to more of you. We hope to evaluate the intervention. So this is a policy-driven intervention in procurement. So we need to go out and collect uniforms that are not, that are not changed in any way that predate the SOA. So anything before 2019 when this came into effect, um, and we'll certainly be doing that in the Brisbane area and hopefully also um, in the northern area as well, because I do believe there are some differences in social norms in the amount of body surface that we cover with heat, etc. And we're going to compare this over time. So the SOA is in effect where our preferred suppliers are with us for four years, is that's right, Vicky? So we then need to get uniforms to measure with our mannequins, or hopefully an automated approach version of that. Um, to see whether there truly was a body surface area difference. Did the sleeves really get longer over time or were they always that length? Um, relative to size. Um, so that's something that we definitely want to do and we'll be doing with size 6 and, and size 12 clothing, hopefully with the help of the department. So I, I do hope that there's some constructive partnership work that can keep going. And um, Jodie's also pointed out that um, Queensland have become leaders in sun safety with this new study. It hasn't been done anywhere else. We're quite a nice procurement model for other states as well as other branches. Um, we've got our teachers to protect our teacher aides. Um, also in the same environment, we, you know, doing duty, etc. There's so much work that we could be doing. Um, certainly other areas of government where uniforms come into play, but, you know, we could be talking to New South Wales and getting them using mannequins. There are citizen science grants around at the moment where we can get schools taking photographs that if we digitise this can actually be evaluating their own uniforms as they currently stand so that we don't have to go out and physically traipse around or see manufacturers in time to accomplish this so that ongoing evaluation can be easier. So there's a bit to be done but it could translate into some serious cost savings and Vicky not having to wait for us to dress the mannequins, you know, like speeding up the process and certainly making that more cost effective over time. And if we can be doing this uh, by even digitising the clothing without having to dress the mannequins, but that's a, that's a whole new ball game because we all have different shapes, etc. But we're certainly delving in that area as well. So much to be done and I do hope that um, yeah, you're convinced that clothing can make a difference to mole development in kids and skin cancer risk over time. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. And I'd like to also thank the department for inviting me. And i like to thank all the previous speakers because as you were delivering your talks, I had many ideas. And as much as maybe my talk doesn't look so connected with, um, with, the, with the central topic uh, for today, which is sun safe and sun smart uniforms, there is much to say about how the process, that, that is what I'm going to talk about, is a process of co-design, uh, can be uh, definitely applied uh, within uh, also looking at uh, applying all the policy requirements for some safe uniforms in schools. Uh, 
Uh, definitely looking at SunSafe um, elements, it was um, considered in this process. Uh, however, I think the main motivation in the beginning was to uh, find um, elegant and uh, what you call good design. And good design is always very difficult to, uh, to define because good design could be many, many things. Um, good design in this instance was um, a smart uniform. Uh, that would make students look smart and pr proud of walking in in a city where they would maybe mingle with the students from other schools and so making them feeling proud around this. So this will be my talk and um, one of the uh, fundamental elements from, uh, for the new school was uh, to uh, shape the school literally from the ground up and the uniforms are literally part of the ground. Um, and within the entire design system of the new school, there was also a requirement for having new uniforms. And as far as um, as far as I know, this is the only designed uniform in Queensland. And when I talk about designed, I mean a whole process of designing rather than pick and choose from some models that procurement has. And this is where I think procurement comes into being as a very fundamental aspect of all the process, not just in terms of uh, requirements, but in terms of working towards finding sustainable fabrics, um, requirements of, um, uh, you know, be part of a whole textile um, concern that there is around clothing. I'm not talking about fashion, I'm not talking about uh, fashion design, but I'm talking about design, uh, clothing in general. And kids' uniforms either are thrown away when you know the person turns 30 or 40 or if they keep them and if they're mixed polyester cotton and many other fibers will be very difficult to separate this fa uh, fabrics they may end up in landfill or if they become secondhand so we we have a whole project around uh, school uniforms and work uniforms. So this is where, you know, connection within procurement would be fundamental. So let's go on. This is the first day of school, um, the 27th of January. After the whole meeting, the school was opened by um, our Premier and uh, Grace Grace is the representative of uh, the city I think, electorate, and uh, these are the students, they are junior, first grade seven, that turned up proud with their school uniform. Um, so how did this happen? Um, the Fortitude Valley School, as you know, was closed in 2013, um, and um, the new school was being built. So um, does anybody know Miss Sharon Barker, who is the uh, principal of this school? And she's done an incredible work in uh, really, um, you know, building this school against the many, many different, um, probably, challenges <laughs> um, that she found. Um, so we were approached, uh, we fashion, I speak, we were approached around the beginning of April 2019. Um, uh, QUT has had already a strong relationship with the school in, in the sense that we will um, develop also more research um, and teaching and curriculum um, with the school. So I was approached in the beginning of um, April 2019 and we connected um, with, the, with the intention of exploring way in which the school and uh, fashion could possibly design the new school uniform. 
the timing was not really good for, uh, for us as we were in the middle of the semester. We had already curriculum and um, assessments set up so we could not just tell students in our um, second year or third year, uh, could you please now um, you know, work with the school and design some bricks and provide some um, flats drawings to, to see and, and so on and develop as a proper um, project. Um, so we um, met uh, several times and then um, I suggested that uh, a graduate with, um, with the technical skills would work on providing this um, technical drawing. So uh, Miss Isabel Biram, who was then a sessional, uh, worked closely with me and um, the principal. Um, so in the beginning, we, uh, Isabel and I, met to uh, look at a series of mood boards. So does everybody know what a mood board is? Putting together various inspirations, pictures and so on and uh, go from there. So Isabel would go back and make some drawings, we would meet and we would look at them and we would discuss things that needed to be modified and so on. So the first, uh, we, we, um, we went through six iterations of these um, drawings um, and this process with Sharon up to when we got to the point of approaching the manufacturer and then that was an entirely different process that we followed um, minimally because our intention was to follow the design first and then all things to do with quality control and so on were up to the school at that point we were stopping but clearly there is also scope for a longer project and I'm going to talk about some longer um, some ideas about some more complex and long, longer projects. Um, so, uh, co-design. Uh, I heard uh, while my, the speakers before me were talking, um, talking a lot about connecting with community and users and so on. So this is where co-design methodology comes in and it's part of design thinking. Uh, probably you have heard of IDEO, um, which is a design company uh, that goes back uh, way back to 1981, but founded in, uh, as IDEO in 1991 and you may be interested to know that they designed the first computer mouse and the first notebook style computer. I remember 1992 I had probably the first um, Apple notebook. And so that was designed by IDEO. So they developed this methodology of co-design, design thinking that starts with empathy with, um, with the people, the users you're designing for and with and then the, you go through whole sorts of process and iterations until you come with a prototype and you test it in the end. So what is co-design? The idea of co-design is that first of all disrupts traditional ideas around creation uh, and design where one individual is the author but it's the, the, the authors are the users and, um, and also the designer. And put it simply, it is a dynamic collaboration okay, between, um, between the designer and the client, if we want to uh, call it, but I like to call it users, um, which, is, um, which aims at creative cooperation. Okay, so um, if a designer is the creative, the co-design process aims at taking also the users to be part of this process. And in the meantime, both the designer and the users grow. I mean, we're learning from each other, okay? And definitely, I have learned from this process myself, and so Isabel, okay? So we are so 
um, focused on fashion and uniforms not fashionable, right? Um, so uh, the idea of using um, trendy or fashionable or um, you know, patterns that make you look good is something that um, probably is the last thing that one thinks about <laughs> when uh, um, one makes a uniform designs or so order a uniform and so on. Uh, so it's about values, it's about valuing what you're wearing and it's about feeling not just comfortable and that feeling also good aesthetically because that's all part of also our emotional um, approach to, to clothing, to what we're wearing. So this was the initial pro process. Um, the first meeting with Sharon is there in a, in a light blue and that is where uh, the light blue, that's the rectangle at the bottom, is the school management, is the school. So they had less input in terms of knowing what they wanted. There was a brief from them, but it was all quite um, chaotic. Um, in our first conversation, this is how it goes, but putting on ideas and uh, discussing and going on to the next thing and the next thing. So from the second meeting, um, also school management started to have a clearer idea. So we start seeing um, that uh, um, although us at the top, that's us, we have a, a quite um, stronger uh, and darker green because we came up with the ideas whereas the school was there accepting it. And as we go on the school becomes much more active in terms of the decision making and what they wanted and what they thought um, uh, it was fitting within uh, their aims and their goals. Um, so those colours reflect also the ideal um, sequence that I showed you before. Okay, so these were my notes uh, in the first brief. Um, and this is highlighting the user, the person. So we tend to talk about what we do and not much talk about what the user or the client wants. Um, and, uh, and so this, is, this was all told to me, you know, I want this, this needs to be in this way, this needs to be in that way. So um, we want something that looks good, that aligns with the university and QUT. Sunsafe is right here, if I can see the pointer, no, that's not the pointer, um, there it is, um, okay, so sun safe and um, also consideration around modesty, considerations about being gender neutral, so this is very important, so for example, pain, the trousers are exactly the same for girls and for boys, um, and um, the colours are definitely <coughs> the same uh, and so on. So that was the second page. Um, as you can see, uh, we went through, we were designing for the junior, the senior, the sports, the formal, the hands, full range of uniform sports and clothes, shirts, tracksuits, zip up jacket and so on and so on. The list that was going on and on and on in the end we had to design everything. Uh, in the end though we did not, we could not uh, do a complete design of all these requirements. So in the end we, um, because of the time constraints obviously, uh, the school, the uniform needed to be ready before the end of 2019 and we understand that it takes some time with the, um, the department, procurement and getting 
through uh, choosing procurement and setting up the whole process. So we had very, very little time. And in the end, uh, we did the generic sports uniform, boys and girls, uh, blazer and the summer um, also uniform. So where did we start from? Literally, we started from this, from the badge. So the old badge um, that Sharon gave me and said, these are the colors. So I took the picture, said, OK, right. So the colors needed to be, uh, to continue to be um, uh, designed within the uniform. They needed to feature the, re the original colors of the old school because it represented tradition and obviously um, g given that the whole building and the whole complex was completely new, although the old school is also integrated within the architecture, uh, it's all new and therefore there needed to be some connection with the tradition and with the past, which is you know, fantastic. It's what you take into consideration when you design. And they needed to, to incorporate an urban environment. As you know, this is the first vertical school in Australia. So likewise, we needed to incorporate the verticality of the school uh, in the design of the uniforms. Okay? So how do you do that? How do you do that in clothing? Um, this is one of the, I believe this is the last version of the flat drawings that we provided and that they went to procurement, to, sorry, to the manufacturer. And so that was the final choice of color. So we needed to incorporate the white, the blue, the gold um, through a yellow and at the same time use QT blue and light blue. Um, to align the two institutions together. Um, experimented with materials, so what we used in the end was a blend of cotton and polyester. Um, and uh, I'm not sure in the end what was used as for the sports uniform, but I believe it was still cotton polyester for the sun's safe um, side of um, the uniforms. And this is what they look like. Um, so the verticality, as you can see, oops, sorry. The verticality, uh, you can see through the lines of skirts and blazers, the way in which the colors from the badge was, was used. Um, the uh, gingham was chosen for modesty reasons, so it's across all um, boys and girls. The blazer is completely similar, although the girls' blazer is more fitting. Um, one of the first um, feedback was that all the teachers wanted the blazer because it looks like a tailored blazer. As a matter of fact, this was um, what came into our um, decision making, thinking about the verticality and uh, the elegance and wanting uh, elegance within um, the school uniform, there was streamlining, tailoring, uh, fitting. So fit for the boys was achieved um, with slightly taking it in the back three seams rather than a boxy um, jacket. And for the girls, it was made um, more tapered and more fitting. Uh, pants also were, um, had this verticality and slimming by tapering uh, along the leg to the bottom seam. Um, so uh, the, the, there is the blazer. So this is the kind of, um, you know, inspiration we looked at for blazers and pants. And clearly we were looking at fashionable um, ideas and they were all very enthusiastic and accepted. 
Um, so these are the other drawings with all the specifications. I mean, they're minimal at this stage, but clearly, um, as you can see, the where am I? The, the back three seems for the boys, and then in the next um, image you will see the girls. Um, that, sorry, actually it is there. That is much more tapering. Um, we looked at the way in which these uniforms, despite being fitting and um, tailored, could clearly fit all the body shapes. Um, so um, there is a tailoring fitting um, idea, but it's clearly something that would um, enhance all body shapes. Skirt, so there were various proposals of skirts, and in the end this was um, the final choice, um, which is very different from all the other skirts, skirts that are normally in uh, high schools with the deep um, pleat at the front, and um, you know, these were all different pleats on the sides. So this was our Final, well, our was Sharon's final choice. Um, this is the school uniform. Um, I'm afraid here we're not complying, uh, but I'm sure that we can uh, improve that. Um, but shorts and also options with the long sleeves, and again, a lot of geometrical design to. Uh, enhance the verticality, uh, expose the colors, continue the tradition, and so on. Um, okay, hat. Hat was decided to have um, not a wide brim, although this is quite uh, a wide brim, but um, it is a different style. It is the fedora rather than a large hat with a, a round <coughs> wide brim, which again, just a simple solution like this, takes away from the normality and introduces uh, a more stylish uh, and fashionable elements. And, um, and these are the last drawings where um, the manufacturer started to elaborate on our drawings, and this is the, um, the last stage. These were the two prototypes that we showed um, at QUT during a Design Week in 2019. So as you can see, we are September, October, so there was a very little time. And um, just um, a detail of the skirt. And uh, we had the wonderful um, feedback in terms of make, in terms of design, in terms of color choices and combinations. And the official opening. Um, here are our students wearing the hat, wearing uh, the uniform. So just to um, <coughs> conclude, um, I, there, is, there is clearly uh, a, diff, a, new st a, a next stage um, through which we have to go, and that is about um, feedback and reflection. It is clear that this um, design of uniforms, this collaboration, did not include students because students were not there. So it was with the school. And one would wonder, what is the difference between what we have done, um, how can we call it co-design, where it looks like a client design, a brief, normal, one of those normal ones. Well, actually, is where the school had a big input, um, the whole school uh, management. And it was capacity building for us and for them. When I say that everybody learned from each other, I'm really serious because uh, clearly the school uh, couldn't um, uh, because, you know, there is no expertise as such in how to you incorporate 
um, design aesthetics within a uniform. And definitely here we have helped, whereas they helped us to think about uniforms and how you transform them, a complex, you know, the whole thing, the shirt, the jacket, the blazer, uh, trousers, how do you transform them in something that looks tailored, fitting, and so on. Um, so I would say that it wasn't the usual client and designer relationship. So what we fostered was instead interpretation of possibilities and education about the process. Um, we followed the co-design ethos in the sense that clearly the school management was making the choices, we were discussing these choices, um, we were looking at, um, you know, failures, where would the uniform fail if we do this or where would improve. And many times it was, uh, you know, the school management saying, well, why don't we do this? So there was really um, a, a creative collaboration. Now, the next stage, and this is what we were already trying to develop last year, but um, it could be a very um, good way to develop this, at least in this school and then maybe in many other schools and expand it, um, is partnership with um, Education Queensland and other university in co-designing with the students, which, is, which would be the real um, co-designing, following co-designing principle. Um, it has to be the users. So students now have an existing uniform. They can comment on what works, what doesn't work, what do they really value, what they don't value. Um, and uh, in this way, they can be empowered on their own decision making and design. And I know somebody could say, oh my God, they would want, you know, shocking pink and the butterflies um, scanned on the shirt and so on. Um, but obviously it, it is, you know, co-designing with, with <coughs> students of even and teenagers of uh, such a young age would actually empower them to really think about what's important, you know, why you have to have a uniform in this way rather than with a shocking pink or whatever. And um, other part of the project would be really work on the value that they um, give to the uniform. Uh, would they keep it? Would they pass it on? Uh, teenagers and young kids are cl very often, because they have very strong opinion, very often um, do not um, like really much wearing second hand and why should I buy a second hand uniform and have a second u hand uniform which would be part of the whole discourse on sustainability would be lengthening the life of the uniform as much as possible and therefore incorporate in um, the uniforms, um, some kind of um, labels um, sewn into the back of the blazer telling the story or just the names of those who wore it and uh, digitalize the stories about the uniform and create, um, you know, a, a digital storytelling uh, for the students that um, revolves around the wearing of the uniform, keeping it, keeping its value and eventually extend it to their behavior towards the whole clothing and, and dressing practices because acuity were very strongly committed to working with sustainability. And in fact, we have in place um, you know, a huge, um, a huge uh, structure that is now looking into uh, textiles, networks, recycling, waste, and so on. So uh, a project like this would be really important for us because we have the ability to work with young people and therefore to develop an education around not just, okay, I'm, you know, I'm worried about climate change, but what can I do as a young person, even as a 
a 12-year-old um, to um, help to uh, fight against climate change. All right, so this is my last, sorry, some references, but that's it.